we are going to look at convex sets in Rn. For that, we need the notion of a line segment in Rn. To motivate the definition, let's look at what happens in R2. Let's pick two points in R2, U and V. In this case, we know what the line segment of U and V should be. It is a section of a line that connects U and V. And similarly, the notion of a line segment in three dimensions is clear. But what if U and V are in Rn where n is at least 4? What would be a reasonable generalization of the line segment to higher dimensional spaces? For that, let's take a look at what happens here if we let d equal v minus u. Then this is this vector here. In the sense that if you start at u and move along this vector d, you end up at v. And from this, we can see that the line segment consists of all the points along the way from u to v. And so, if we look at all the points u plus lambda times d, where lambda is a fraction between 0 and 1 inclusive, then we'll get all the points on the line segment between u and v. And this is certainly true for two dimensions and three dimensions. And we'll take this as our definition for the line segment between u and v. So the notation is this open square bracket u comma v close square bracket. And it's going to be the set of all points u plus lambda times d, where lambda is between 0 and 1, inclusive. And if we substitute v minus u for d, we can write this as 1 minus lambda times u plus lambda times v, such that lambda is at least 0 and at most 1. And so this set is the line segment between u and v. Now, take a subset of Rn and call it c. And we say that this is convex if for all x, y in C, the line segment between x and y is contained in C. So let's look at an example. Suppose my set C looks like this. So C is in R2 and is represented by the shaded region. From this definition, we see that this is not a convex set because if you look at the line segment between these two points, there is some point on the line segment that is not in C, and so this is not convex. But what about this? It's a triangle in R2, and if you try enough pair of points, you'll see that no matter which two points from the triangle you pick, the triangle is going to contain the line segment of the two points. And we can say that this is a convex set. From this illustration, it seems clear that checking non-convexity is easier than checking convexity because to show that something is not convex, you just have to find one pair of points and show that there is a point on the line segment between the two points that is not in the set. Whereas to show a set is convex, you might need to consider infinitely many pair of points. So we need to make use of the information given by the definition of a set in order to prove that it is convex. Notice that by this definition, the empty set is convex because this condition will hold vacuously. There's no point in the empty set, so there's no way you can pick a pair of points, and so there's no need to check this. What we're going to do now is to show that the line segment between two points is a convex set. In R2 and R3, this is perhaps clear because if you take a line segment between U and V, and if you pick any two points on the line segment, the line segment clearly contains the line segment between the two points that you pick. But that is just a proof by picture and is not a rigorous way to establish this. So what we need to do is we need to go through the algebra and show that the condition for being convex is satisfied. So take any pair of x and y in C. Because x and y are on the line segment between u and v, there exists lambda x and lambda y from the interval 0, 1, such that x is 1 minus lambda x times u plus lambda x times v, and y is 1 minus lambda y times u plus lambda y times v. Now take z on the line segment between x and y, then there exists lambda in the interval 0, 1, such that z is 1 minus lambda x plus lambda y. But what we're going to do is we're going to write z as alpha times x plus beta times y 
where alpha and beta are non-negative and alpha plus beta equals 1. Doing this will make our algebra a little simpler, but this way of writing is clearly equivalent to this way of writing z. So what that means is we're going to plug this into x and y and see what we get. So z is going to be alpha times 1 minus lambda x times u plus alpha times lambda x times v. So this whole thing is alpha times x and then plus beta times 1 minus lambda y times u plus beta times lambda y times v. And if we group together the coefficients of u and v, we'll get alpha minus alpha times lambda x plus beta minus beta times lambda y times u plus alpha times lambda x plus beta times lambda y times v. Here we're going to observe that since these are non-negative, this coefficient of u is also non-negative. And same thing for this. This is going to be non-negative. So these two are non-negative. But what we also know is if you add these two coefficients, they add to 1. So in particular, if I let gamma to be alpha times lambda x plus beta times lambda y, this can be rewritten as 1 minus gamma times u plus gamma times v. So the 1 comes from alpha plus beta. And this here is our gamma. So z can be written as 1 minus gamma times u plus gamma times v. But we said before, 1 minus gamma is going to be non-negative. As well, gamma is non-negative. So this means z is in the line segment between u and v, and so z is in c. So every point in the line segment between x and y is in c, so c contains the line segment between x and y, and so c is convex. One final note, the intersection of convex sets is again convex. It doesn't matter whether you are intersecting infinitely many sets, it can be shown using first principle that the intersection of convex sets is again convex.